Hello and welcome to my lab. Today I thought I might show you a bit more about the microcontrollers we've been using. These microcontrollers I use are the Cypress PSOC microcontrollers. PSOC stands for Programmable System on Chip, but that's a mouthful, so we'll stick with PSOC. The one I use most often is the PSOC 5. I get these little kits called the Kit 59, and they're just these little sticks here. And they're nice because it's really just the microcontroller and the cool thing is it comes with the programmer so you can program it with a USB here but then you can break it off and then you can use that to program other things. There's a PSOC 4 version of this which we'll get into later. It doesn't come with the little programmer so I would suggest getting one of these first, breaking that off and then using that programmer to program the PSOC 4 devices. You can get a programmer on its own, but that's a lot more expensive, so I suggest just doing this. These PSOC microcontrollers run the usual ARM Cortex cores, and they have a really nice free development environment. What makes them especially nice, though, is the PSOC part. Around the ARM core, there is a programmable hardware structure that gives you a lot of flexibility. You can route pins around and change the way that they behave really easily in the program. You can route the pins into a built-in op-amp and then an ADC, or you can route them into what's called a universal digital block, which can perform state logic uh, completely without intervention from the CPU. If you don't know what any of that means, that's okay. We plan on making a series of these videos to help give a practical understanding of how to use these tools. So this PSOC 5 has a lot of other features that I'm not going to list today because that would be a lot of features to list. But one of those is built-in USB 2.0. This is actually one of the more advanced features that you can set up in the PSOC, but I consider it to be so universally helpful that we'll start with that. Because then you can plug this right into your computer and look at the serial port. That's very helpful for any kind of hello worlding at all. So if you're interested in learning how to work with these PSOC microcontrollers, uh, just bear with me because if you can set up the USB, uh, most everything else is going to be pretty easy. We're also going to give you a little bit of a taste of the hardware-based logic that you can do in this guy. So let's begin. We are going to program the microcontroller such that if you press the onboard button, the onboard LED will toggle on and off, but also the USB serial port will report on state changes of the LED. For the sake of being thorough, we're going to start all the way from the beginning, so we're going to need to install PSOC Creator. First, we need to make sure that .NET Framework 3.5 is activated on the computer. You can do this by opening the Turn On and Off Windows Features feature and checking this box. Now you can download and install PSOC Creator. You can get it by following the link in the description and pressing Download PSOC Creator for Windows. Once you get to this screen, I suggest for the sake of convenience to uncheck Open Release Notes, Launch PSOC Creator, and Launch Update Manager, and then check Continue Without Contact Information. Now that it's installed, we can ensure that the programmer built into the kit has the latest firmware. You can use PSOC Programmer to do this. With the programmer plugged into your computer, click on the programmer in this menu here, click Utilities, and then Update Firmware. Note that you only have to do this the first time. Now let's open up PSOC Creator. And before we open up a new project, we need to make sure that all the components are up to date. This is another thing that only needs to happen the first time. So click on Tools, then Find New Components. Then you can select PSOC 5 LP, because that's what we're working on. Show Only Newer, and then just select All. Once we hit Install Checked Components, it'll grab them all and update them automatically. Now we're all up to date and ready to go. Now we can create a new project and select the device that we want to program. You can select Target Device and then bring down the drop down menu and select Open Device Selector. There are a lot of PSOC devices, but the one we're using here on this kit is going to be this one, so just select this one. Then select Empty Schematic and if you care, name your workspace. After you hit finish, it'll bring you to the top design schematic. If you look to the left side of your screen, you can see the workspace explorer. This is where you can select the top design schematic, the design-wide resources, which is where you set most of your system settings, and also your source files, which is the code that will run on the CPU. 
In the top design schematic, you can define pins, ADCs, communication ports, and a bunch of other stuff. You do this by pulling components from the right side of the screen. You can actually define your own components, but that's for another tutorial. So let's open up communications, USB, and pull in a USB UART, which is just a quick way of defining a serial port via USB. Then we'll give it a name and hit OK. The cool thing about PSOC Creator is that once we hit the build button, it's automatically going to generate all the source files needed to interact with this USB. All the source files that it generates are going to use the name that you gave it. That'll be important in your program later. Okay, now let's define some pins. First we're going to define the input pin, which is going to be the onboard switch. Then we'll give that an appropriate name. The pin definitions in the PSOC are very flexible, but normally for a digital input you're going to be using a resistive pull-up or a resistive pull-down. If you want more information on that, you can Google those terms, but to explain it quickly here, I'll tell you that the resistive pull-up that we're about to use is going to weakly pull the pin to a high voltage state. Then the button that we're going to attach to the pin, when pressed, is going to pull this low to ground. There's a lot of information being shown in this diagram here, but essentially what it's telling us is that there are two drive states for this pin. One that pulls high through a resistor, and one that pulls low directly. We aren't going to use the low state, so we'll just set the initial drive state to high and keep it there. Now we will define the output pin for the LED, and give that an appropriate name. Then we can just set this one to strong drive, with the initial state being low because we do not want to have the LED on by default, for completely arbitrary reasons. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, does it? The interesting thing that we're going to do here is that we're going to define this as a digital input as well. We will uncheck hardware connection, and this is going to allow us to read the pin from the code, while also setting the pin via its hardware connection. Now let's have some fun. We're going to define a debouncer component. What this is going to do is define hardware that will continuously check the input and make sure that it stays high for a certain amount of time before allowing it to go into the rest of our logic circuit. When you press a physical button that's connected directly to your microcontroller, it tends to create a couple of short spikes on the input while it's transitioning. This will filter those out. Then we need to define a new clock. You can pull the clock component out from the right side there. And the way that this works is it's going to use either the internal main oscillator or the internal low frequency oscillator. You don't really need to know what those are yet, but just know that there are two main clock sources in your microcontroller, and every other clock is going to be derived from those sources. 200 Hz should work for this, and because it's so low frequency, we'll use the internal low frequency oscillator. Now we will go to the digital and logic section and pull out what's called a toggle flip-flop. The output of this flip-flop is going to control the light directly, and the input will pull this directly from the negative pin on the debouncer. The negative pin pulses for one clock cycle every time it detects a negative transition on the input. And in this case, a negative transition of the signal means that the button is pressed because the pin is high by default and pulled low by the button. So this means every time that the button is pressed, the toggle flip-flop will toggle the light. Now we'll move on to the design-wide resources section. Click on the pins tab, and this is where we can define which physical pins are associated with our pin definitions in the top design schematic. In the PSOC, all the pins are defined in terms of ports. Each port has a sort of grouped functionality. We'll go over this more in the future, but for now just know that there are ports and pins. So if you see written on the actual silk screen of the board something like 2.1 or 2.2, that refers to port 2, pin 1 or 2. For use with this kit, just set the pins as you see them here. Do note that if you don't define a pin, PSOC Creator will try to define them for you, which may or may not be helpful. Here we'll just let PSOC Creator define the USB pins because it knows which ones it needs to use. Now for probably the most obscure part of setting up the USB, we need to adjust the system clocks so that the USB can have a clock that is accurate enough. All of the clocks are defined by multipliers of the system clocks. You can divide a clock by any kind of power of 2. 
In this case, we're actually going to multiply it by 2. And the way that that works is outside of the scope of this video. If that's something you'd like to know more about, you can Google phase locked loop. But we need to set the internal main oscillator such that when we do multiply it by 2, we get the correct clock for the USB. You will see here that the USB clock has an exclamation point next to it. Let's just double click on that to bring up the system clocks configuration. There's a lot here, so don't get intimidated, but we just need to set up the internal main oscillator up at the top to 24 megahertz. Then the ILO needs to be set to 100 kilohertz, and then check the USB. Here you'll see it says IMO times two, which is 48 megahertz. This is correct. With all of that configured, we can hit build, and this will generate all of the necessary source code. Now we can move on to our C code. Many of the components that you can define in the top design schematic need to be initialized in the code. You can do this by calling the components start function like this. Now let's move on to the application code. We can read the state of the LED by calling the components read function. Notice how all of the functions are auto-completed when you're typing. Here we will write an if statement that will only evaluate as true when the light state changes. Then we will simply read the light state and output through the USB using the USB put string function. That's really all there is to this application, so let's go ahead and debug it and see if it works. So we'll just hit the debug button and that will compile the code and program the target. This menu will pop up and you should see the programmer on that menu. Just select it and press OK. On the right side of the screen you'll see TerraTerm, which we will connect to the USB serial port that we've made. As you can see it's t reporting that the light is off and on and off and on. And even when we halt the CPU, you see that the USB serial isn't reporting anymore. However, the light is still turning off and on. That's because the light is controlled through the hardware, whereas the USB is controlled in the software. So that's how you set up a basic USB serial port in the PSAC 5. If you'd like us to cover anything specific in the upcoming videos, let us know in the comments. Also, there will be a GitHub link in the description to the source files in this project. So thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.